Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to EdPost Conversations. And I'm excited today to be here with Elisa Stad, who spent a, a large part of her career in um, brand and international business. Um, but she took a shift and became a children's book author. Um, and we're here today to talk with her about her book. It's called Mama's Love Language. Beautiful, beautiful images. <laughs> and um, I will go ahead and turn it over to you, Elisa, to tell us a little bit about yourself and, and maybe a little bit about the book. Thanks very much for having me, Lisa. Um, love what you guys do at Ed Post. Um, so I, yeah, that's right. I, most of my career has been in business, um, living abroad in Asia and really building brands and companies um, overseas through international expansion and global expansion. And um, a little bit about me, I um, grew up in a really biracial household. Um, I have a mother who is um, a Chinese Vietnamese um, refugee um, from Vietnam who came from Vietnam War. And I have an American um, Caucasian father who grew up in California. So throughout my life, I've had this calling and trying to chance to understand myself in terms of my identity. Because when I was with my Asian side, I felt very white. When I was with my mm -hmm. Asian side, I felt very Asian. When I lived abroad in Asia, I felt very white. When I lived in, I grew up also like in Boise, Idaho, I felt very um, Asian. So I really felt like I didn't, it wasn't cool to be mixed. And I didn't, was trying to find my ear in international development. I've always wanted to bring a business overseas back to Asia. And, and that's what I did with my career. And I thought it was a really beautiful um, melding of my personal life and, you know, my career interests. Um, it was interesting when I was based in Hong Kong, I was able to really connect not only with, you know, some of the senior management that was, uh, were expats, but really the locals who were speaking Cantonese and Mandarin. And I felt like they were my family. And so I could have conversations like deeper conversations with slang and understanding and, um, food with, with, the locals as well as the expats. So through that experience, I really started to understand the benefit of having a foot in both worlds. Um, I'm a, a mother uh, of three young kids now, and I've always had a calling to also write a, a book and go into my creative side. Um, and as a parent, I've always wanted, when you become a parent, you really reflect on yourself as a child and your relationship with your own parent. And then how do you um, raise these little ones um, mm -hmm. differently or, or, you know, and you also have received, you have the same pattern sometimes of your parents that maybe you like or don't like, but um, it, it really opened my eyes to um, put pen to paper and write my story because I wish I had a book like mama's love language mm -hmm. um, when I was a kid because I really felt there weren't a lot of examples of books, stories, Barbie dolls that looked and represented me. And I know there's starting to be more and more these days, but I think um, a lot of kids uh, may not feel like they fit in. And I think books are a natural way um, to tell a child indirectly, like you're okay. And it doesn't have to be their story, but there's um, a conversation starter. And I read your book um, earlier, I actually read last week, this past week, and um, what I picked up from this book is that you were telling your personal story. Is that true? Yes. So the character, the protagonist, Jade, um, is, it, you know, it's a symbolism of my my upbringing. Um, mm -hmm. There's a little girl, Jade, who um, has a parent who is also a... Um, is an immigrant. So her mother has an accent, um, doesn't look like all the parents, her skin's a little mm -hmm. darker and she wants to, um, so Jade, the little girl feels a little uncomfortable because mm -hmm. not only does her mom look different, her mom shows love differently. The book is called mama's love language. And in the book, Jade is, um, 
getting dropped off at school. And there is some imagery here where the mother, you know, is not, I mean, I don't know if you can see in the book, but um, mm -hmm. is basically all the other parents are hugging and embracing their, their kids. Right. And Jade's mom doesn't do that. That's just not mm -hmm. her culture. Um, and, you know, there, she's connected. She's giving her lunch. She's, there's, a, there's an act of service, that love language. But, and so there's just all this, um, these stories within about, you know, her mom at a grocery store and the, the person can't understand her, her mom's accent mm -hmm. and Jade's feeling a little embarrassed. So just her understanding of herself and then also looking around the room. And I, you know, I, in my personal life, I moved around every four years um, as a child and I, I lived in Idaho um, in my like formative years, I guess. And I, you know, around the room, there were, there weren't a lot of uh, other ethnicities um, mm -hmm. in school with me. And so uh, there's this scene in the book where she's doing a self portrait and Jade doesn't draw herself looking like herself, but she draws herself with like, you know, blonde hair and blue eyes like you, <laughs> you know? And, um, in my experience, like I, you know, that's not exact story of me, but in a way I remember as a child, I drew pictures of myself, you know, with blonde hair and blue eyes. Mm -hmm. Um, and now as an adult, I'm like, why would I, why did I do that? Um, I also had, you know, you know, we, we had Barbie dolls back then. Right. So in that, that was the example. I mean, they were blonde hair, blue eye. Mm -hmm. So, um, anyways, there, there, the, to answer your question, yes. Um, the symbolism of Jade is part of my upbringing, but I'm using that symbolism to share with other kids messages of understanding one's identity and differences, mm -hmm. um, and also allowing in a sense, like a healing process of a child to understand like they're okay because they don't, even if they don't fit like all these other kids, they have a unique way of being. And then she takes a journey through the book where she becomes a little bit, um, she's a, a little, um, I guess, frustrated and angry uh, at first and pushing away her Asian background. And she takes a journey to learn um, and, and develops this new appreciation of uh, who her mother is and, and the culture that her mother is trying to teach her and the foods and, and the things that um, she was trying to push away to be more Americanized. And it's a yes. beautiful journey that she takes to the end um, where she, she comes to understand that she's part of both and, and embraces that. So, um, you know, her story, it, start, it starts out a little sad, but at, toward the end, um, she's really proud of who she is and it's such a positive message uh, to give to kids that might read this book um i wonder did you have um a lot of texts or um, lessons or anything like that in school as a child when when you were having that um the, the struggle of how do i fit in and what is my identity did you have a lot of educational materials or stories anything that you could draw that same inspiration from when I was a child, when I grew up, did, did I have any sort of inspiration, a story like that? Um, I mean, I cannot, I mean, obviously when you read books as a kid or you're watching cartoons, there's a protagonist and someone wins in the end and there's an underdog and there's stories like that. Um, you know, reading little books like Maramona or, you know, Babysitter's Club, like all those Nancy Drew. I mean, there's books that keep you going, like you, you're rooting for the, the underdog, um, right. that, that, uh, per, um, archetype is very common in right. books. Um, to me, why I wrote this book is I just didn't see there was one. I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't have like a, like a North star, I would say as a child, um, in terms of a learning, um, because I didn't have someone that like looked and lived the life like mine. So I didn't really identify directly um, in the characters, I would have to say. Um, you know, like the, the little house on the prairie, like, you know, you, you identify with the main character, but it's not, they don't, they don't live the life. They're not eating out of rice bowls with chopsticks. They're not, they don't, you know, so, but of course I love them. They helped shape who I am as, mm -hmm. as an American and as, as, as an adult, as I am today. Um, 
it, it's funny. I mean, when I was a kid, I was talking to someone that like the only um, role model I had, I think was like Connie Chung, that was like a news anchor who was like, <laughs> A, a, a successful Asian woman that was out there in the public. Um, but yeah, I mean, I do think books are a way um, to uh, softly um, connect intimately with a child and make them feel okay. Um, I, I wouldn't say I had like one that I, you know, I read like the secret guard. I mean, I, I would dive into books because they're, they're an escape, but it's also a learning one-on-one um, -on -one where it's not a teacher saying you're okay just the way you are. And like, and I think my experience where I felt there's two experiences I've had as a child in education that I felt really seen. I think it was in fourth grade. Um, I had a teacher, her name was like Mrs. DeYoung. Um, and I was living in the Bay area at the time. And we went on a, um, a trip to Sacramento to learn about the gold rush. And I, I was a really shy girl. I, I didn't talk. I, I was studious. I did my work, but I just, I was not outgoing at all. Um, and I think my teacher noticed that she knew I was bright, but I just did not engage with, you know, a big group of people. And I remember she made me her hiking buddy. And so she made me feel so seen and special that day that we, she was my partner and she made me laugh and she just really engaged with me. So I think the critical thing in education is for a child to be seen. Um, the second example is again, I think sixth grade, I, um, a teacher, I just moved to Boise, Idaho as a new student and my teacher, her name is Mrs. Newman. Um, she just made me feel, I felt very, um, I felt just good in the class that she knew I was there. Um, I got attention in the sense for my academic performance. Um, and I just felt, and, and I remember this transition going from elementary school to junior high. I remember I was in tears on the last day of school, but she made me ready from that transition of adolescence mm -hmm. of being. Seen. So I feel in life, it's like, is it the educator? Or is it the tools that they use, whether it's through books and education? Now we're using film and podcasts and, you know, documentaries and, and there's many other um, modes. But, um, but yeah, I really, I, besides those two, those teachers, I don't know if I really had one saying specifically, like, you know, just because your mom is in it, because literally where I live, I, I felt there was, there was no parent that looked like my parent. Um, everyone no one had traveled outside of, um, you know, really out of the U S so I had this life exposure, but it wasn't cool in a way because no one understood. Yeah. It's difficult. And I think you touch on a couple of really important concepts. The first, um, one I'm, I'm thinking about is the representation and how important it is to, for you to be able to see yourself as a kid in the characters around you, in, you know, the stories that are part of our learning, whether they be storybooks or uh, educational curriculum, um, and not being able to see yourself represented, not being able to have those role models that are um, like in front of you all the time um, is, is a problem for kids if they don't see themselves in their text. And with that, I'm wondering, um, with this new uh, pressure to uh, ban books and whole um, books that deal with um, different races, cultures, lifestyles out of classrooms. Um, what is your take on that? What is that likely to do to the kids that don't have culturally appropriate, culturally affirming uh, materials to, to engage with as a youth? Yeah, I think it, it, the banning of books hurts not only the students it represents, but it hurts the whole entire community. Even if it's um, a book about a race, let's say it's, um, you know, about the African-American American community, and it's not just about that African-American child, but it's mm -hmm. the other children in the room because they're not educated about, like, that's the same thing Mama's Love Language. It's not just about an age, it's not just for Asian kids, right? It's for right. for the neighbor, your, you know, it's for the neighbor of the Asian kid or the neighbors, your neighbors, your classmates to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so today I just, you know, I live in Santa Barbara with 
you know, limited diversity as well. And I taught um, six classes before, before I saw you just this morning. Wow. I did it like 30 minutes each um, to about Chinese New Year. And most mm-hmm. of those kids had no idea what that was. They never seen a red envelope. They just, I was shocked. So, um, but if we don't expose children to the, the, beyond the bubble they live in, beyond their parents and their home community, that's, that's a role of education, the educator, because I think a parent can only do so much. Um, a parent is only exposed to what they know. And so they haven't traveled abroad or exposed with other cultures. A child can't grow their mind and we want these children to be future leaders. So in terms of banning books, I mean, I think there's a truth that's happened in the world. And I think, um, there probably is an age range when, you know, you can talk about topics as direct as you want, but they're even at, you know, the early kindergarten level to teach a child about human rights, I think is really important. Mm -hmm. I don't think we need to talk about all the murders and massacres at that age, but you can talk, um, it's a truth that's happened. And we're not trying to shove things under a rug. Um, And we're also not to, we're not, the role of educators, not also to create trauma, right? But I believe in something called karma and cause and effect. And so um, if you look at what's happened in the world with war, it's a repeating cycle. Right. Some, you know, one party's angry at the other. We use violence, violence, more death, more danger, mm-hmm. and it just repeats itself. So I, I really believe when you educate at a young age, these youth, we have hope for the future to um, have more resolution and more um, composure to have respect for humanity in general. Right. And for, for all of the kids, you know, to be able to understand the cultures of their, um, their classmates and their community Mm -hmm. members. Um, And it's something I know as a kid, I was always very interested in um, all of the other cultures and all of the other things that I didn't see. We, We had very limited diversity where I'm from too. And um, it bothered me that everybody looked like me and nobody was different around me. And I was very interested in getting out to, to discover more about the world, um, discover more about different cultures. So it was something that drove me to leave for a while because it just wasn't available to me mm-hmm. um, in my space. So also to be, um, you know, we could argue whether or not that anybody banning books really has good intent or bad intent. I'm sure that's something that we could debate, but um, it's good for kids to learn about the world and mm-hmm. it's good for them to be able to understand where all different kinds of people are coming from, from all lifestyles, races, regions. Um, so it's, I, I thought that was great. I read your book with my grandson. Um, he's three and he enjoyed it. He sat still the whole time and listened, which is rare, but he was very much, in, he was very into it. <laughs> um, and I do think, um, you know, something else that resonated with me that you said is that, you know, not being able to find dolls and different things. I remember as a kid how important it was for me to, um, you know, look, there were dolls that had dark hair or light hair. Like I always wanted the blonde haired doll. I wanted mm-hmm. the one that looked more like me, um, you know, when way back in the day when the Cabbage Patch dolls were popular, like I had a certain one that I wanted because it looked <laughs> more like me, you know. Um, ironically, they were hard to get and I didn't get, I had a redheaded one. But, um, but that's, that's like kind of, uh, I can see that being a really big deal to kids because it was a big deal to me. And it's so nice that today we're starting to see more of, um, more diversity in dolls, um, no matter, you know, what they look like. We even have dolls with disabilities. We have dolls that are larger than others, um, and looking a little bit more natural and not quite like a doll that movie star all the time. Um, so we have seen progress. Um, since then. Now you mentioned your mom and you have three kids. So um, when um, you're teaching your children about their culture, um, are are they having the same struggles as students in schools or have they um, have they had a different way of dealing with that because it's once removed? Your your question is, do they feel different at school? They feel, yeah. Kids? Well, they, so my kids are a quarter Asian now, right? Mm-hmm. So they actually have blue eyes. <laughs> so they look less Asian than I do. And, you know, 
it's always up for interpretation. People are always like, what are you? Right. Something. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> well, I don't I actually think they, I mean, I am very intentional, which, you know, my mother and my parents, you know, you just want to be American in that generation in the nineties. Right. So, and if you're an immigrant, you just want to assimilate. So I think my generation, um, there's an opportunity to go back and reflect with our lineage. And so I make it um, a, a, like a practice where the kids, like, for example, the Chinese New Year, I make sure that the kids go into their classroom. They, they came with, my kids were with me to present to their class about mm -hmm. Chinese New Year and the traditions. Like, for example, one of them is you can't cut your hair on Chinese New Year. Like just, there's like these taboos, but it's interesting, right? <laughs> Um, right. foods that no one's ever seen some, some kids have never had a dumpling before. So it's just, it's, it's just, it's wonderful. I love like the opening their eyes, but to answer your question about the kids, do they feel like I did? I don't think they feel, um, well, we've lived abroad in different places, but, um, I don't think they feel, um, they are out of place. But I think they're aware when other when other kids are treated differently, mm -hmm. and it may not just be about race. It could be about there's things you know like social economic where their parent you know there's kids at the school their parents have an accent they're immigrants, and are they not part of the the clique or whatever? So they do notice when someone is not treated fairly, and mm -hmm. I think. Um, that them having empathy for other cultures and understanding. Um, I took the, so I started a diversity club at our elementary school, which we never had. And it first time ever in the lifetime of the school. Um, and we went to visit the historical museum and they had a little section about um, the Japanese um, who used to live there, but they mm -hmm. didn't want to talk about the internment camps. So they have, they're like, we only, we're here to talk about the good things of the old days, but the street in um, downtown Santa Barbara actually was a Japan town and there were Japanese homes there. And the story is quite sad, right? You know, the Japanese were sent to internment camps. They were, their homes were sold at 10 cents at a dollar and they were finding all these, um, I took my children and a lot of children from the school and the docent told us about that these underneath where the homes used to be where the museum is now there are porcelain cups and bowls where their families um dug and, and put a hole and dug all their like precious china mm -hmm. and put it under the ground because they thought they would come back they never right. came back and my son and it's interesting so it's like this subtle these subtle actions is where the children actually can absorb right mm -hmm. and there was a little bowl that they had dug up. They didn't talk about the internment camps. They just showed them this bowl, the, the, all the old um, archives um, uh, under the ground of like ch beautiful china that they found that were broken. They put together of a little bowl, bowl that looked like it's a little boy's bowl. It had a Japanese little boy with a baseball bat or something. And then my son, <laughs> afterward, he's like, I don't like this place. I don't like this. How do they treat people like that? That yeah. that bull belonged to somebody, and he he looked he was like tearing up, but the the docent wasn't trying to tell you about it. He they wanted to just not talk about it, but he could observe from seeing these um, items from these young children that used to be there, probably a child his mm -hmm. age, his little rice bowl, and then there used to be a Japanese um, uh, temple or. Temp Japanese church and now it's like a you know someone else took it over mm -hmm. and it just like almost says it's almost like these people were erased from the history books anyway so I think that they're able to when I saw my children's face because they know they're Asian so they do have a connection with it that they felt very empathetic toward mm -hmm. um the disrespect to you know a, a certain um group of people and a community that was wrong. So he knew it was right and wrong. And he's like, I'm not happy with this. So I think that was, it was a really eye-opening moment for me to see, wow, my kids are actually getting it. Right. <laughs> yeah. They blew up. <laughs> I know a lot of people would say the word empathy had become for a while a buzzword. Um, yeah. 
for, for some folks politically, but empathy is a good thing to develop in our kids, to be able to connect with those experiences. And, um, you know, that's great that, and speaking of kids, I do understand one of your children was, um, had played a large role in your actual publishing of your text, of your book, um, and, and encouraged you to kind of push it over the, the finish line and to like achieve that goal or dream that you have for yourself. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So I wrote this book. Um, I, you know, I was going back and forth to Asia and the U S and I just, it made me reflect on my career, but also my, my personal life and just the bond of the East and the West and, and childhood. And anyways, so I wrote the story five years ago. Um, I started on a flight and then mm -hmm. I rewrote it probably like 25 times or so. Um, and then I remember during COVID, I brought it out again. I'd wrote it right before COVID, maybe a year before. And then during COVID, you know, it's sheltered in place with um, my son. And he was, and I, sh I shared the book. He's like, oh, wow, that's really, you know, that's really good, mom. Okay. And then I, you know, then I was like, okay, you should really publish it. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just, COVID was over. Well, not over, but, you know we moved on and I just, I was like, oh, I don't know if I can really publish this. This is not, like, it's, it's your ego, right? As right. you know, all of us, as um, I think when you're in a creative process, like if you're working in a business, it's not, I don't feel like it's me. I'm working for a company, but when it's a book, or it's a creative, it's me. It's my heart on a, right. on a platform here to, to share with the world. And so about, a year, two years ago, he's like, Hey mom, he reminded me again. How about that book? Mm -hmm. And, you know, <laughs> and, we Jade, and we're, how about Jade? What happened to Jade? And I, it really took, it, it, it jarred me for a second. Cause I said, okay, if I don't have the ability, the courage, cause I need courage to go across the line, and actually make this book happen. Um, that's one thing, but I need to do it for my kids to show that I can do it. Right. And he just looked at me in admiration. And so it was so beautiful. So then I started working on it and, you know, we got the illustrator and editors and, and the whole team and we got it done. And it was, um, we just published it in November, just a couple months ago. And it's done so well. I I'm literally like overjoyed by the amount of responses, like you, what you said about your grandson. I had a friend yesterday who read it to her classroom. The kids had so many questions. Um, the, the librarian was like, we need, we need more copies of this because we've never seen the kids so engaged in dialogue after a book because um, they reflect in their own lives. But, um, but yeah, so my son was really instrumental for me to cross the line and I had to let go of my ego and just do it for um you know, the next generation to show, Hey, you can, anything is possible. If you put your heart into it. And so I'm, I'm very happy I did, but I was very nervous. It felt like giving birth to a child. <laughs> I think the day I published it, I was in tears. Like, oh, and, and then my son came to me and he said, I'm so proud of out of nowhere, mom, I'm so proud of you. <laughs> so, you know, that's all I needed. I don't, you know, it's like, I don't need any award or anything. It's just like the fact that he feels that I did it and he, you know, loves the story and yeah. So, yeah. You know, I imagine he's, he's so proud um, that, and he inspired you the same way that kind of you were hoping to inspire him to make, um, make his dreams come true as well as he moves on and sets goals for himself. So that um, I thought that was a fun part of your story that I found. Um, but um, so you're, with this tech, with this book and um, the work that you're doing, um, talking about this, the, the experience of being multicultural family. And um, do you, what do you feel are the strengths? Um, there was certainly struggle for you, but what do you feel are the strengths for both yourself and your children as you engage with um, all of that, which makes up your identity? And 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 create for yourselves kind of a um, an I a, a really rich identity. Um, what do you think are the strengths that you're able to gather from knowing your history, knowing your identity, and pulling all of the pieces of yourself together uh, to become the person you are? It's a good question. A really good question. Um, okay, the strength. I would say this. 
the strengths I would say are being um, adaptive, um, literally being multicultural. You can, because it, although it was very difficult mm -hmm. to jump from home to home and different, it was like a different planet every time, you know, depending on what family I was going into, my parents are, you know, my, my Asian side or the white side or a different country. Um, but you can adapt. And also, um, you know, I feel like my, my sisters and I, and I think many people who are multicultural, they can mm -hmm. jump into a community and survive because mm -hmm. they had to already it, at, from, from birth in a sense, you know, whether it's, you had to change your language, you had to take off your shoes and, you know, follow the traditions, <laughs> be loud, be quiet. Um, be formal, be more casual. So I think the adaptiveness of um, flexibility, I guess is a good word, flexibility um, in, in environments is a, definitely a strength. Um, that's why I was able to live in Asia and open a business there because even though I was American, I was also Asian, right? So mm -hmm. I could understand two worlds and partner together and to, to build a, a unit. Um, I think the second um, benefit is openness that you're not as judgmental. Um, you just accept as it is because you're exposed to more than one culture. There's not just one way of being. So, um, I think when you're engaged with life, um, whether you're a child or an adult, it's like, you just take the person in as they are without judgment. Um, and then I think the last piece is, um, I think you're, you can be more adventurous, um, cause you see the world as a globe more than just this, you know, one pocket of, of, of the world. And mm -hmm. so you're just exposed. So when you are, um, looking at the world more globally, you're willing to try new things like weird, different food that looks exotic or, um, travel to a new place, or you want more, you, you're open to more experiences. Right. So let's say those are definitely the benefits. And, um, like I said, I mean, even in the early days I was super shy, but you know, I was absorbing everything. I would say I'm not as shy anymore. I, something <laughs> happened, <laughs> but, but still, you know, but I think the observation as a child to like, take in the world and process mm -hmm. it. It's almost like that was the phase of life. And then now I feel I have a, a purpose of sharing my experience to help others. Mm -hmm. So, so they can be seen and have, see that as a tool, because I think all of us only grow from obstacles. I never heard of anyone um, growing when their life has been easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, the same token would go to even, kids in education, like the multicultural um, exposure in classrooms um, or in communities to be able to, um, to be able to be like a, a sieve like you were and taking in the various pieces that can make up their community culture and the, the people who they're with every day learning um, would likely give them those same benefits to be able to be a little bit more global and be a little bit more understanding and accepting. Um, as well. So you put your book, your baby out there in the world. Yes. Uh, what was your hope for uh, the book? What did you hope it would be become um, yes. to the children that are reading it or the families who are reading it to their children? So I realized the book is not just, it's not just a, a book. It's not just to check the box and make, write a book. Right. Oh. I really think, you know, mama's love language is really a, it's a, it's almost a movement. It's a, it's a message I want to get out into the world, mm -hmm. like what you are doing with Ed Post, but it's really opening doors that around, and I know diversity also is a trigger word for some people, right. <laughs> <'Cause> it's, <laughs> but it's, I'm in a positive way. I want um, children and parents and educators to know that um, there are other stories out there that are untold mm -hmm. and we can only learn by hearing these stories of uh, not the traditional story, but the untraditional story, which is, you know, the spice of life. We say, you know, mama's love language is um, 
you know, Hainan chicken rice is like part of this, you know, a, a food, right? But some people don't even know what that is. What's Hainan chicken rice? I don't know. What What is that? But when you hear, but it's, it's, um, the idea is to open up that there's other ways, like diversity is not just skin color in my book. Mm-hmm. Um, it, diversity in this book, it's about mama's love language. And so it, there's also diversity of how one communicates and shows love. And I thought, even writing this book is a very healing process for me to understand my mother's love language and my parents' love language, because um, it's, you know, it's not one size fits all. And this mother um, loves her daughter dearly in this book, right? Jade in this book, but the mother doesn't show it like all the other parents. Mm -hmm. And I think whether you're, um, you know, you could be living in Kansas or California. You could have a mother that doesn't show love through affection, right? That's not a skin color thing, but it's, it's just a way of being because maybe the upbringing. And so Mm -hmm. I want others to know that um, it's okay, but that your parents love you no matter what. Usually your parents are like loving you unconditionally, but it's not always one size. Mm -hmm. So that's one message. Um, the second message is really the 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 bond of a a child and a parent and how a child doesn't really know their parent before they existed. Mm-hmm. And so in the story um it gets very, you know, can be a little emotional from the parent who's reading it maybe about Jade's mother who was a, in the Vietnam War and how she couldn't finish school. And that's why Jade's mom is really encouraging Jade to focus on studies. So I think all of us, whether you're an adult or child to understand our parents' upbringing and why they are the way they are, because they're human and they love you dearly. And so this is just one way to show, hey, I never thought about who my mom was before I was alive, right? And so um, I think that's a beautiful message. And then the last point is um, as Americans, and in, in, we're a melting pot. We talk about America as a melting pot is, you know, I really want all of us to really connect back to our lineage because we all come from somewhere and we're American, but um, we all have traditions. And, you know, maybe if it's not your mother, it could be a grandparent or great grandparent that brought some tradition, a special food, a way that they hug you, a, a, a word, a language. And we, and I'm not saying like, we don't want to forget about that, but like, let's celebrate it and like keep it in our lives. And as we come become parents, we pass that baton to our kids. Like this book is a, is a chance for you to remind um, the next generation to pass it on to their kids and Mm -hmm. remember um, the struggles that one's gone through to make their upbringing and, and and the way they, they love. Yeah. And I think, you're right. It connects. I'm, as you're speaking here, I'm thinking about um, my own family and the traditions that were starting to like fall by the wayside as people were getting older and people were passing away. And um, probably for maybe the last five years or so, I, I started with holiday traditions. Like, what were the holiday traditions that I remembered from my my great grandparents from when I was a child? Um, mostly like Eastern European region mm-hmm. you know, traditions that, and we have a, a large population around where I live of, of people who come from this background. So it's not hard to um, stumble upon the foods or, you know, different things, but I had very vivid memories as a child of certain things that happened on holidays um, that we just weren't doing anymore. Um, my grandparents um, came and they were uh, great grandparents, I guess, and they were very much about fitting in. Right. So uh, they didn't want to teach their children or grandchildren the language or the dances or the things. And uh, when I think about that, sometimes I think I feel like I'm at a disadvantage because the people who who were really immersed in that culture, who knew it well, took it with them. Um, And we, you know, we didn't have the opportunity to learn um, like some other families do and pass down the language and pass down all of the traditions because they were very busy trying, like Jade, very busy trying to be American. Um, and so I didn't, I didn't know a whole lot, just the things that I could get out of context in terms of language and those type of things. So, um, in, in my family here, I started just 
adding a thing or two back in at the holidays that I remembered. And uh, whether it be a particular type of food or something we would do around dinner or, you know, different things to try and put that back in um, to, to where it was lost. And hopefully, you know, the ones who come after me will take it with them and, and make it be a part of their holidays too. So um, it's, it's just such a, um, a critical thing to think about those cultural differences and, and what, um, what we do bring from other places that make us who we are um, important to everyone. Um, and, and also like to learn a whole lot about what other people bring. Um, exactly. I remember as a, a college student, I spent a lot of time with, um, with a diverse group of, of women and we would spend some time learning. Uh, there was one woman who was Jewish. There was one woman who was Muslim and, you know, uh, from various, like there was one woman who was Chinese and we would, um, share like at certain times, like culture, religion, foods, you know, different things to try to, you know, just introduce our friends to the different things that, that were unique to us and about, you know, our identities. And it was such a fun thing to do. Um, but I don't know that everybody does that. And, and I would think it's a, it would be a great thing too. Um, but yeah, that's a, it's a great message. Um, whether we often make judgments, I think uh, kids do, adults do, we all do about the way a person is behaving. Um, and there's a lot of life experience that is behind um, what Jade's mom is doing like in the book. Um, when she learns about where her mom has come from and what experiences she had, she she seems to have a deeper understanding for, oh, I get it now. This is why education is important. This is why we don't you know, hug like the other parents. This is, I understand it now. And this is her way, like the book, the love language, this is her way of loving her daughter is to give her the things that she didn't have an opportunity to have. Um, so it's, it's so nice that by the end of the book, she, she, you know, finds that and, you know, uh, embraces that and understands where she maybe didn't understand before. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, I love that you um, also are trying to bring, you know, traditions back into mm -hmm. your family. That's so beautiful. Um, and yeah, and the book is just to remind you not to, you know, just say, hey, have you thought about where you come from? Like, right. let's not lose that. And yeah. And I think for a long time, many generations of just trying to fit in, like my mother, mm -hmm. she, I, I speak Chinese because my grandmother helped raise me. But at home, she didn't really speak Chinese to us. I went and like self lured and I moved <laughs> to Asia. And but, um, but I think she just wanted us to fit in, right? To survive, as especially when you're an immigrant and you're a refugee, you want how do you survive? You got to fit in. Um, and yeah, I think um, it's just beautiful if everyone just takes the opportunity to look at all the different. Um, heritage is out there and you don't, and don't judge a book by its cover mm -hmm. uh, at our school. Like I said, we started the diversity club, you know, we have a very, it was only 9% um, diversity and that's everything socioeconomic included. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I was like, well, where is everyone from? Is anyone from Australia or, you know, Europe, anyone Italian? And so we all have something mm -hmm don't judge a face. Right? right. And we realized we had 22 countries represented, you know? And so I was like, wow. And it, it's, and so the word diversity is not um, them versus us or we're a special group because, you know, we, we have darker skin. It's like, we all have something to put to the plate, whether it's, you know, high tea for the English culture or it's, <laughs> um, a doll and for Indian, right. There's just, we have, but it's, um, it's just awakening those, like there's no um, pressure if no one wants to research, but just that it's available to all children, all families, all educators to just talk about what's going on in the world. And, um, and especially with the community that exists, even if it's just one person in your community or not in your community, just to learn because, um, yeah, I think books and, and speaking with people in your own environment is a way to learn if you can't get on a plane. Right. And you right. can't immerse yourself. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like the book gives you a, a book, gives you a way to visit all kinds of places um, right from the comfort of your home. Um, and, you know, if whether you travel or don't, it's it's a nice escape. Like you said, it was an escape for you to read, too. <laughs> um, so what's next? Are there more books for you? 
Um, it's a good question. Um, yes. So the plant, so what's next? Um, well, mama's love language, um, is like the first step in terms of really opening this passion I have around multiculturalism and, um, diversity and sharing and lineage. I just believe that this has to be discussed in schools, um, in a kind and thoughtful way, right? Um, where we can just, just expand our minds and learn and just be aware of the world beyond um, our neighborhood. Um, the plan is to write another book. Um, I also um, have created a, um, so I'm also, this is a side thing, you can edit this later, but is um, mm -hmm. I have a center um, with UCSF, which is one of the major mm -hmm. hospitals in children's hospitals called Benioff Children's Hospitals. And I have an integrative pain palliative integrative center for children. Mm -hmm. So I'm considering maybe send, creating more books and actually like putting the proceeds towards um, the, it's called the STAD center of pain palliative and integrative medicine. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, but yes, there'll be another book. Um, and it's, you know, when this book, and I'm going to continue to go out there, I'm, we're doing lots of events and promotions and things like that, but I just want to get the story out there first and like really build a platform mm -hmm. and the idea there will be another book. Um, and it's, it's around this concept of mama's love language. Um, is it a, another culture? Maybe. Is it the love language between siblings? Maybe. So there, there's a couple ideas out there, um, but there, there it's, it's in the works. That's awesome. I was wondering if Jade would continue with you or if, uh, if there'll be new characters. Yes. Um, that's wonderful. So multiculturalism is, is key to your work moving forward. And we should expect um, both that and, and different types of love language and learning so that people can just expand their minds, kids, adults, communities, um, everyone uh, to be able to learn more about the world around them and the people that they interact with every day. That's exactly. fabulous. I'm really interested in the, the siblings one because there are two grandchildren now and they're getting into that phase where they're stealing each other's cookies and pushing each other over. And, you know, it's uh, interesting. Um, and sometimes we say, oh, brother love. They used to hug, but um, sometimes one is biting the other now when they're that close. So <laughs> um, the love language between them is very interesting. So siblings is a, a great idea. Um, but I so enjoyed your book. I thought it was, and the, the colors are beautiful. It's just such a, um, the, the palette that you use made it so pleasing to look at. Um, and the, the, the artwork is fantastic, but mostly the, for me, the story, I, I will tell you that the, the page that, that hit my heartstrings the most was the, the drawing where you could see the drawing from above and see what she was drawing on the page. And I thought, oh my goodness. Um, but very real, very real experience for kids who are in a classroom and feel a little bit different for whatever reason that they're feeling different. Uh, but this was such a great book and I'm so glad you're going to write some more. Um, yeah. very good. Is there anything um, the, I haven't asked you? The, oh, the, the point about the page that really caught you, um, uh, when I've read it out loud to schools and for events, kids always stop on that page and they like look around. So it's interesting that it always called to you as well. Yeah. And, um, I love that you noticed the illustration. So, um, the illustrator that I worked with, I really wanted, um, because it's an emotional story. It's like a deeper mm -hmm. story. And I wanted something that could be intimate with a, you know, a caregiver and a child or an educator and a child can engage with this emotional story. I wanted the palette to be more like watercolors. So calming versus those yeah. jarring bright colors that, you know, in children's books that wake you up. So right. it's a, you're alert, you follow through, but it's a more of a serene yes. experience. Thank you for mentioning that. It um, is. You have yeah, some of the hues of blues and greens and even like the oranges and reds are a little bit um, deeper. Um, something about it, it is. You've, you've, you've nailed it. It's very, it's a relaxing read. It's um, very pleasing um, to the eye to look at what was done here. So it's just beautiful, beautiful book. Um, and, then, and the last thing I want to say is food. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the mother, her love language is food. It's acts of service. Um, and I 
food is is my love language. If anyone knows me, I <laughs> love it. I'm a foodie. So I also want to introduce, if you go on my website, you know, I have a recipe for Hainan chicken rice. I want um, to have more exposure to different types of food mm -hmm. um, for, for, for everyone, for children, for families, um, because um, it's another way, uh, a sensory way to absorb a culture. So I love um, that food is part of it. And even though it's some unique words in there about the types of foods, mm -hmm. um, that encourages um, children to try something new that they would never try in yeah. the past. <laughs> so many lessons um, and and subtle subtle lessons that um, we're finding in the in the book about the different way people ways people live. And I, I love that. Um, is there anything else that I haven't asked you that you'd like us to know about the book uh, about your journey? Um, good question. Um, I. I think you had most of it. I think um, what I want to say is I want to encourage. Um, so, yeah. So, I mean, my lesson in this is it's just, it's really beautiful because everything happened quite naturally. It's, mm -hmm. um, you know, we talked about the courage that I had to have with my son, um, you know, pushing me along the line to, to do it and getting and birthing this child, this, this, you know, fourth child. Um, mm -hmm. But also, um, the, you know, when you, when you give something to the world, it like comes back to you. And so I just like, just hearing your feedback and hearing readers feedback about what they got from the book. Um, it just, that's what makes life rewarding as an author to feel like mm -hmm. you are connecting to heartstrings of readers and that it opens up a dialogue, um, for a child or a parent or a grandparent or a teacher. To, to think. And I want, you know, the purpose of the book is to make you think. Um, so I'm happy so far it's going well. Um, but I realize books, it's like, you have to keep going out there and talking about it and sharing so you can grow to other communities. But, um, um, but no, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share the book with you, um, and educate, you know, uh, young students and educators around, uh, the concept of multiculturalism um, and diversity and inclusion because everyone you know deserves a voice so thank you for sharing your story. thank you so much for sharing your story with us and and your journey to becoming an author um, and uh, i wish you lots of luck um, in, in best case scenario um, if everything went exactly the way you want it to with this first book where does Jade's story end up? Does it end up um, like, how does she end up? How does she impact the world? Jade as a character? Her, her, oh, book. her story, her oh, book. The size of, okay. Yeah. I mean, I think, yes, big picture. I see that um, m more young people and young Americans, mostly because we keep, if you know to create world peace i think we keep mixing and mixing mixing with each other then we're all one you know we, we have all cultures in us because we right. um, uh intermarry and have kids from many many cultures now right um right. so i think this book i would love this book to be like a, a treasure that everyone that grew up reading that they know about because it teaches that you know, teaches communities about the the respect of the parent and child and multiculturalism, the whole symbolism symbolism of this melting pot, but how challenging it's it's really addressing the truth of it, how challenging but um profound it is for you to grow as a human being. Um so I yeah, I wish this book was in everyone's arms and I think <laughs> it could be something bigger. I, I mean, I could see it even being like a, like a, like a mini series, like even animation mm -hmm. um, to educate kids. So like multiple stories around mama's okay. love language. Um, Cause I know kids are always, hopefully most of them are reading, but also they, they have other methodologies of obtaining information. So um, if it's um, 
in a, in a video form or a TV series form, that would be amazing. But the, the mm-hmm. purpose of this is just to get the story out to say, it's amazing how fortunate you are to struggle being from multicultures, but also what a benefit and to really embrace mm-hmm. and appreciate it because you will be more open. You will be flexible. You will see a bigger global picture and you're willing to try new things. So like go, go yeah. you, you know, and um, <laughs> whether it's not, and even it's not you to, to want to jump in. And, and, and I think this will allow um, Americans and society to, to build more um, peace mm-hmm. and respect and education with each other. Cause we right. get to know what other sides are thinking versus it's, you know, my way or the highway. So really I'm just trying to open up another door, um, but a big door that everyone knows about mama's love language and they, they get the messaging and they have that conversation with their parent and about their grandparent and where they came from and, um, and children around the, around the country and the world really have to heart, um, kind of who they are and have the confidence around it. So then they have the courage, right? Like I was thinking about my story about, I needed courage for my son, but I hope this story and in my story, even writing the book will give courage to, you know, all um, parents and children around the country. Wonderful. So now where can our listeners find more about you and find your book so they can bring it home? Um, okay. So my book is available in everywhere you books where they sell books, like bookstores, but also Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble, bookshop.org. Um, all are available on there online. Um, and it's called mama's love language. Um, and it says sometimes love tastes like high on chicken rice is <laughs> the title. Um, and the, sorry, the second question, <laughs> uh, where can they find out more about you and your oh, journey? Yeah, I have, a, so I have a website. It's just alisastad.com. Um, just my name. And there's more about the book. There's recipes. There's, um, activities for kids, um, and you can have updates on events and activities there. So elisastad.com and um, find me online and also Instagram. Sorry, we have an Instagram as well. Yes. Well, I'll tell you that this is now part of our um, children's library um, for my two grandsons, and we will read it many, many more times. They love to read. And I thank you again so much for taking the time to tell us uh, about your book and about your journey. And I hope you'll come back uh, and tell us about your next book when it, when it arrives. I will. Thank you for the time. And I'm so honored to be here speaking with you. And I appreciate you sharing it with your family and um, all your listeners. Um, and I look forward to connecting to you, with you about the next book. Great. All right. Thanks again.